We walked for hours. He did not collect or show me any plants. He did, however, teach me an appropriate form of walking. He said that I had to curl my fingers gently as I walked so I would keep my attention on the trail and the surroundings. He claimed that my ordinary way of walking was debilitating and one should never carry anything in the hands. If things had to be carried, one should use a knapsack or any sort of carrying net or shoulder bag. His idea was that by forcing the hands into a specific position, one was capable of greater stamina and greater awareness. I saw no point in arguing and curled my fingers as he had prescribed and kept on walking. My awareness was in no way different, nor was my stamina. We started our hike in the morning and we stopped to rest around noon. I was perspiring and tried to drink from my canteen, but he stopped me by saying that it was better to have only a sip of water. He cut some leaves from a small yellowish bush and chewed them. He gave me some and remarked that they were excellent and if I chewed them slowly, my thirst would vanish. It did not, but I was not uncomfortable either. He seemed to have read my thoughts and explained that I had not felt the benefits of the right way of walking or the benefits of chewing the leaves because I was young and strong and my body did not notice anything because it was a bit stupid. He laughed. I was not in a laughing mood and that seemed to amuse him even more. He corrected his previous statement, saying that my body was really not stupid but somehow dormant. At that moment, an enormous crow flew right over us, cawing. That startled me and I began to laugh. I thought the occasion called for laughter, but to my utter amazement, he shook my arm vigorously and hushed me up. He had a most serious expression. That was not a joke, he said severely, as if I knew what he was talking about. I asked for an explanation. I told them it was incongruous that my laughing at the crow had made him angry when we had laughed at the coffee percolator. What you saw was not just a crow, he exclaimed. But I saw it and it was a crow, I insisted. You saw nothing, you fool, he said in a gruff voice. His rudeness was uncalled for. I told him that I did not like to make people angry and that perhaps it would be better if I left since he did not seem to be in the mood to have company. He laughed uproariously, as if I were a clown performing for him. My annoyance and embarrassment grew in proportion. You're very violent, he commented casually. You're taking yourself too seriously. But weren't you just doing the same, I interjected? Taking yourself seriously when you get angry at me? He said that to get angry at me was the farthest thing from his mind. He looked at me piercingly. What you saw was not an agreement from the world. Crows flying or cawing are never an agreement. That was an omen. An omen of what? A very important indication about you, he replied cryptically. At that very instant, the wind blew the dry branch of a bush right at our feet. That was an agreement, he exclaimed and looked at me with shining eyes and broke into a belly laugh. I had the feeling that he was teasing me by making up the rules of the strange game as we went along. Thus, it was alright for him to laugh, but not for me. My annoyance mushroomed again and I told him what I thought of him. He was not cross or offended at all. He laughed and his laughter caused me even more anguish and frustration. I thought that he was deliberately humiliating me. I decided right then and there that I had my fill of field work. I stood up and said that I wanted to start walking back to his house because I had to leave for Los Angeles. Sit down, he said imperatively. You get peeved like an old lady. You cannot leave now because we're not through yet. I hated him. I thought he was a contemptuous man. He began to sing an idiotic Mexican folk song. He was obviously imitating some popular singer. He elongated certain syllables and contracted others and made the song into a most farcical affair. It was so comical that I ended up laughing. You see, you laugh at the stupid song, but the man who sings it that way and those who pay to listen to him are not laughing. They think it is serious. What do you mean? I asked. I thought he had deliberately concocted the example to tell me that I had laughed at the crow because I had not taken it seriously, the same way I had not taken the song seriously, but he baffled me again. He said I was like the singer and the people who liked his songs, conceited and deadly serious about some nonsense that no one in his right mind should give a damn about. He then recapitulated 
as if to refresh my memory, all he had said before on the topic of learning about plants. He stressed emphatically that if I really wanted to learn, I had to remodel most of my behavior. My sense of annoyance grew until I had to make a supreme effort to even take notes. You take yourself too seriously. You're too damn important in your own mind. That must be changed. You are so goddamn important, you feel justified to be annoyed with everything. You're so damn important that you can afford to leave if things don't go your way. I suppose you think that shows you have character. That's nonsense. You're weak and conceited. I tried to stage a protest, but he did not budge. He pointed out that in the course of my life, I had never finished anything because of that sense of disproportionate importance that I attached to myself. I was flabbergasted at the certainty which he made his statements. They were true, of course, and that made me feel not only angry, but also threatened. Self-importance is another thing that must be dropped. Just like personal history, he said in a dramatic tone. I did not want to argue with him. It was obvious that I was at a terrible disadvantage. He was not going to walk back to his house until he was ready, and I did not know the way. I had to stay with him. He made a strange and sudden movement. He sort of sniffed the air around him. His head shook slightly and rhythmically. He seemed to be in a state of unusual alertness. He turned around and stared at me with a look of bewilderment and curiosity. His eyes swept up and down my body as if he were looking for something specific. Then he stood up abruptly and began to walk fast. He was almost running. I followed him. He kept a very accelerated pace for nearly an hour. Finally, he stopped by a rocky hill and we sat down in the shade of a bush. The trotting had exhausted me completely, although my mood was better. It was strange, the way I had changed. I felt almost elated, but when we had started to trot, after our argument, I was furious with him. This is very weird, I said, but I feel really good. I heard the calling of a crow in the distance. He lifted his finger to his right ear and smiled. That was an omen, he said. A small rock tumbled downhill and made a crashing sound when it landed in the chaparral. He laughed out loud and pointed his finger in the direction of the sound. And that was an agreement, he said. He then asked me if I was ready to talk about self-importance. I laughed. My feeling of anger seemed to be so far away that I could not even conceive how I'd become so cross with him. I can't understand what's happening to me, I said. I got angry, and now I don't know why I'm not angry anymore. The world around us is very mysterious, he said. It doesn't yield its secrets easily.